Hello and welcome to the Sheldrake Vernon Dialogues with myself, Mark Vernon, and Rupert Sheldrake. Hi there, Rupert. Hello, Mark. Rupert, today we thought we would talk about life. Sounds quite a big subject, but we want to take a particular way into this, which is to ask, what is life? Try and go for this sort of very direct question and see where it might take us. And Rupert, um, when I was thinking about what we might say, I was taken back to when I did O-level biology, um, now GCSE, of course. And I remember we had to learn, I think, seven criteria or characteristics of life. So they were movement, respiration, sensitivity, control, growth, reproduction, excretion and nutrition. I do confess I looked that up. Um, but the thing about that in relation to our discussion now is that these are characteristics of life rather than saying what life is. And of course, there are plenty of exceptions to that as well, where a virus is in that would be one question. But then also, is this limiting life too narrowly? Maybe there's other kinds of life or maybe we want to extend the notion of what's animate too. Um, so this question of what is life shows up again, even as you're trying to pinpoint characteristics of life. So I, I think it's a really good discussion that we might have trying to work out exactly what it means to be alive. That list is really designed to uh, apply to biological life. And we normally think of life as biological life, you know, animals, plants, fungi, microbes. Um, and you know any other categories of living organism we can think of. But the word life has often been used in a much wider sense than that. Um, for example, if you look up on in a physics textbook about in astronomy, uh, you'll find the life cycle of a star. And it tells you, you know, how stars come into being, how they mature, and how they die, you know, or shrink or explode as supernovae. Um, but the word life cycle of a star is used in a quite unselfconscious way in physics. It's not in inverted commas as if this is a metaphor. Um, it is the life cycle of a star. And when we look at the broadest possible picture provided by theology, then we find statements that say, God is life. Um, and so the concept of the life of God and or, or in the Christian creeds, you know, and the life, I believe in the life everlasting um, or I believe in life after death. Um, so there's a kind of life there which is nothing to do with excretion and reproduction and so on. Um, you could say that the stars um, grow they do grow you could say they excrete in the sense they have coronal mass ejections you could say they have a kind of activity within them with all the convection currents and solar cycles and so forth um, so they have some of the properties on this list but they're not biological organisms and clearly god is not a biological organism either so we've got uses of the word life which are very wide indeed and we've got life after death as well which is again uh, uh, obviously refers to a continued uh, conscious life yeah and i think that behind that just to do set up a bit more background um must be that uh, the one word life in english is a kind of collapsing of two greek words so if you read aristotle when he talks about life, which incidentally he does quite a lot in his book on the soul, and because soul is the animate quality within something, whether it's an organism or not, um, that gives it this kind of dynamism. Um, he has these two words, um, zoe and bios, and one refers more to biological life. Um, slightly confusingly, it's actually the word zoe. Um, so that says in life and death and generation and these kind of characteristics. Um, but then there's bios, and that does mean more like life cycle or something that can have a biography. Um, it's something that there's a story to tell. 
um, that sense of liveliness um, and so purpose and so on are built into BIOS as well, um, which, of course, as we've said, you know, many times in our discussions, um, the kind of notion that there's a telos, um, a formal and final cause that's working in nature um, would be caught up in the notion of BIOS. Um, but life now in the one English word um, can't make that distinction very easily. And so hence, um, I think part of the kind of confusion you're talking about. Thinking of the ways in which the, the biography of something could relate to its life. Uh, if you think of the life cycle of a star, it has a beginning, it has a development, a, a, a process of maturation and, and functioning as a star, and then it has an end, a death. Um, it explodes or something. And that does give it a kind of biography and it's a kind of process that it goes through. And in the wider sense of life that was used in the Middle Ages and in Aristotle, and in Aristotle as interpreted by St. Thomas Aquinas as the leading medieval philosopher of life, um, then it applies to animals and plants, which are biological life, but it also applies to planets and stars. So they thought the stars were alive and indeed the earth is alive. And we have that in, in a modern scientific form in the Gaia hypothesis that treats the earth as a living organism. So we have this broad sense of life as organisms and what organisms have in common with each other is they're self-organizing. In other words, they're autonomous. They have a certain limit of, 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 of the earth has a limit, it's earth shaped and earth sized and, and its gravitational field extends far beyond the earth but the earth itself is a limit and there's the atmosphere and the layers of the atmosphere, the solar system has limits, the galaxy has limits and that too has a life cycle, galaxies come into being and develop, they have biographies, sometimes they collide with other galaxies and, and even fuse together. So, there, so what seems to be involved in life in general is a beginning, a kind of process, and a, a possible ending, and perhaps also a telos or purpose of the whole organizational system. And that would cover stars and planets as well as living organisms. And of course, stars and planets don't reproduce, um, and galaxies probably don't normally reproduce. Um, and of course, a lot of living organisms don't reproduce, like worker termites or nuns. Uh, so there's the reproduction certainly not a universal character of living uh, organisms. So yeah, this, this wider so, sense of life, you see, gives the sense of a inner development, which would give a sense of a biography, as in bios, um, that a sun or a star or galaxy has a history, a developmental history. And if we take it to its largest possible scale, um, at least within nature, the entire cosmos, according to the Big Bang theory, uh, has a history. You know, there's a moment of origin at the Big Bang itself. There's a period of rapid inflation, extremely rapid growth, followed by the continued expansion of the universe, which is still going on today. The whole universe is growing. It's, as far as we know, limited in the sense that the universe is one thing. That's why we call it a universe. Um, it has a, a history you can read in cosmology textbooks about the first four minutes and then the development of uh, the galaxies and uh, the ex continued expansion of the universe, speculation as to whether it will go on expanding or whether it will slow down and then begin to contract. But the entire universe is alive. Uh, both in traditional cosmology where it had a world soul, the, the whole universe was animated by the world soul or the universal soul, which is the principle of life of the universe. Um, and even in the modern cosmology, it has these characteristics of a story, a biography, a process of growth and development and um, internal change and a possible end in the form of either expanding so much it finally evaporates into light, as Roger Penrose suggests, or the expansion slows down, uh, uh, stops and it begins to contract and it ends in the opposite of the Big Bang, the Big Crunch. So both these scenarios have 
an end to the life of the universe. Um, so in, in all these senses, life is vastly greater than mere biological life, which is, I suppose, characterized by cycles, as in one of those definitions you gave the, of Zoe, that the, that definition of life has cycles, uh, one after another, whereas the universe could have cycles. Some people think the end of this universe is the beginning of the next. Uh, but as far as we know, if it just has one life and our star just has one life, it still has these characteristics of a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a, a, a whole developmental process. Yeah, and I mean, it reminds me of um, Mary Midgley, the philosopher of science, or she often wrote about science, and how she made this observation once that the life sciences have become life blind. And I think by that, she meant that if you study the characteristics only, and of course, you study them often statistically and mathematically, you get this, as you put it, this fog of maths that surrounds the study of the thing and becomes the object of study in itself. And so you lose contact with the very phenomenon that you are trying to study, the liveliness itself. And, and so then you have these problems again about, you know, what does it mean to say that a son has life? Um, and she looked as well at uh, an older distinction. It's caught in a couple of phrases which can be translated as um, nature, natured, um, or nature naturing um, and the difference there is that um, nature natured is the phenomena it's the kind of objects if you like out there that can be studied as objects but nature naturing is the very life process itself which you have to approach in a more subjective way um, it's it's known by being part of that very nature naturing um, and so for example um, when it came to the modern discoveries we say of ecology and um, Humboldt um, the um, German scientist who was as I've understood it who was very involved in the discovery of ecology um, it was by being in nature and feeling the very processes of nature as much in his intuition and imagination that enabled him to come up with various ideas about how, for example, there's, um, diff the, there's, there's connections between different kinds of life depending upon, say, the temperature um, of the environment in which they live, or these deeper intuitions that he had about how ecologically life is a unity, that everything has a part to play and fits into a greater whole. And um, that is to start to detect something about the very power of life itself. Um, and you mentioned Gaia there, and I think that part of the reason why Gaia is controversial, although Mary Midgley was a great advocate of Gaia, is because the idea that there's built in, not just feedback processes in the earth, um, but that there's a power that shapes all the different creatures and indeed um, the materiality of the earth itself in a kind of unity, in a kind of harmony that can be tipped off balance and then has to find a new harmony. Um, it's that deeper notion of life um, that this older distinction again, and I think people like Mary Midgley have been on to. That, that, that sense that we need to be able to, it's going to be more through contemplation um, rather than just pure objective calculative study um, that that life in nature, nature naturing opens up to us. It's interesting, the very word nature implies life, doesn't it? Because it comes from the same root as being born, you know, natus, uh, born, um, and native, someone who's born in a country. Um, you know, when you're traveling in, in, in India, people often ask you as an opening question, where is your native place? It means, where were you born? In my case, England. Um, so the, nature itself implies life. Uh, and the, the entire nature, since nature covers the entire universe, then again, it's another way of pointing towards the life of the universe through the very word we use for it. I think it's interesting, though, if we take this biological approach to life, it actually helps in 
uh, illuminating things that we normally think of as inanimate. Um, for example, an atom or a molecule or a crystal like a rock. Most people would think of, of rocks as inanimate. Um, but even atoms, molecules and rocks have a kind of biography. Um, atoms first appeared soon after the Big Bang. Um, the first ones to appear were hydrogen atoms and perhaps some of those original hydrogen atoms are still hydrogen atoms today. And carbon and nitrogen and iron and other more complex atoms are usually thought to ar arise in supernovae, exploding stars, um, through nuclear processes. But once they've formed, unless they're radioactive, they go on remaining those atoms for millions of years, presumably billions of years in some cases. So they have a formation process, which is through nuclear fusion or fission or whatever the nuclear process is that gives them their nucleus and they aggregate electrons around them. But then uh, their biography stops in terms of the, of the internal life of an iron or a carbon atom. They can take part in other molecules. An iron atom can be part of haemoglobin, um, a carbon atom can be part of uh, you know, insulin or protein or of methane or of carbon dioxide and it can change the molecules it's in and there's a sense in which these molecules have a kind of life because they come into being you know a cellulose molecule in a plant is built up through the photosynthesis of the plant and then when you burn wood on a wood fire it's burned and turns into carbon dioxide and water um, so these atoms have a continued life but the molecules of which they're part have a shorter lifespan usually and then if they're in crystals um, they those can have a quite long lifespan as a process of becoming as a snowflake forms uh, those the water molecules take up their places in in a hexagonal pattern often a very elaborate pattern with the six arms being very similar to each other and, and, and complex pattern of those six arms but once it's formed as long as it's cold it will stay more or less like that i mean some snowflakes in the polar regions remain snow for thousands of years but then in other places it would melt and then you'd have the water molecules be liberated back into liquid and they can then evaporate and you can get more snowflakes so there's a what i'm saying is there's a short history or biography within atoms, at least it's short in terms of becoming, but once they've become, they can remain much the same for enormous billions of years. So there's not much more process going on within them. Um, they, 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 and then we'd call them, I suppose, inanimate or dead. Um, although in panpsychism, there's an attempt to say, well, even atoms and molecules have an organizing principle. Well, they certainly do could give them their form and to man maintain their form, but they don't necessarily have a very interesting biography if they remain the same for very long periods. And the crystals that make up a rock um, can be, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of years old, as in some of the rocks that we have here in Britain. Um, and of course, the mountains undergo erosion and continental plates moving around thrust up new mountains and stuff but there's uh, so there's a life of the earth that underlies the movements and of, of these rocks but the the life of a rock is if it has a life is a very very slow life most of the time so even in things that appear dead um, the constituents have a kind of history and possibly even some kind of mentality according to panpsychism yeah that i that the panpsychist way of putting it that you know, everything has a kind of characteristic or a habit or a tendency and whilst in very well relatively simple objects like you know say um the atoms in a rock um those habits and tendencies um are, are fairly predictable even fairly stable once um the thing is formed as you're saying it's still nonetheless a kind of inclination to be that way um, rather than just seeing it as a completely dead, mechanical, inert bit of stuff, um, and and I think this this th you know this must matter to life too because of course life to us also means to be aware 
um, to have, um, well, sensation, sensitivity was one of the characteristics. Um, I guess you can describe that in a purely mechanical way, like um, a sensing and then a response, like a bit like a cause and effect. But actually, of course, sensing for us and for other animals and who knows, um, plants and fungi in their own way, um, this is um, a much more felt kind of interactive response. And then for those creatures that have self-consciousness, it can be a reflective response as well. And this seems, it's got to be part of any description of life, I think. Um, partly because we, when we respond to the living world, you mentioned um, things like snowflakes there, um, very beautiful objects. Um, they have a felt impact upon us. We are struck by their harmony, by their symmetry. Um, I'm a great fan of Iris Murdoch, um, the philosopher, and in her book, The Sovereignty of Good, she writes about um, contemplating the flight of a kestrel. And she notices that she'd been um, feeling a bit frazzled. She'd seen this kestrel, watched it fly through the sky, and then her sense of being frazzled sort of dissolved as she contemplated the beauty of the bird's flight. Um, and so there's a communication there. There's something about life between her and the kestrel um, that had a felt tangible impact upon her. Um, and I think that um, Mary Midgley, again, she talked about how we need to think about the kind of knowledge we have of the natural world, as she put it, a loving union. Um, there's a sense in which our mind reaches out and touches the things around us. Um, but because our mind is affected, um, it's like we receive something from another kind of mentality, another presence, something, again, that has quality, not just quantities. Um, there's something about the power of nature itself that we are in touch with in that moment that has an effect upon us. Um, so this is just all to say and try and... Um, it gives some sort of voice to how it might show up that the experience of being alive must be part of any account of life as well. And moreover, the shared experience of being alive, even and maybe particularly across species and even and particularly across what is otherwise called the boundary between anima and inanimate objects. Panpsychism, as, as you mentioned, is, is, is one of the ways that I think people are trying to find um, a voice to talk about these things again. Yes. The biggest picture of all, though, would be the life of God. And because it says several, I mean, in the Christian Bible, the life of God, and it's taken for granted in all religions that God's, in a sense, whatever name people give to God, has some kind of life, uh, not dead. Um, you know, Nietzsche said God is dead. Um, and that was really a denial of God. But the but when you, the, the whole point of God is that God is supposed to be the supreme principle of life from which all other forms of life are derived. And so I wonder how these ideas could apply to God. Um, the biographical sense of life, as in bios, um, would would apply to God in the sense that God has a history, at least a history of interaction with the world. And if we just take the straightforward Judeo-Christian model, you know, in Genesis, uh, where God creates the world in the first place in a series of stages through light, through separating the, have the dome of the heavens and that which is beneath, you know, through the separation of the sea and dry land, through the, the production of life, on the earth and in the sea um, there's, and then finally of humans there's a series of creative steps where god says let there be light um, or, or let there be you know let the earth bring forth living things and 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 trees and plants appear um, there's a, a creative process uh, but god is interacting with that creative process you know god sees it and it, it was good god saw it and it was good so there's an interaction between god and the life of nature um and the spirit of god breathes the life into living things in in a part of the creation account in the second book of genesis second chapter of genesis so um there's a sense in which god is the source of life 
Um, and in the version in St. John's Gospel, um, where the creative principle of the universe is the word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God and the word was God. Um, it then goes on in, in, in um, I just wrote it down to, the, um, here we are. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. That's the word, the logos. And this is identified in the Christian tradition uh, with, with the incarnation of Jesus. But obviously Jesus of Nazareth wasn't there at the beginning of the creation or the, the, the whole universe wasn't created through Jesus of Nazareth, a man born in AD zero. Um, uh, this is a cosmic principle and some would say this is the cosmic Christ. The entire creation is the incarnation of the divine word. Um, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life. So the idea is that the, this primal creative principle, which can be seen as the cosmic Christ, um, uh, is a principle which contains life within it right from the beginning. And as this is fleshed out more in, in Christian theology, the principle of life, that, that which is, gives movement uh, and life to things is the spirit, the breath. And that's it, God breathes into uh, the earliest animals to make them alive. So we've got the logos, the formative principle, the principle of form and order. And we've got the principle of spirit or movement or energy or change or breath um, or process uh, within it um, as a model of the entire creation and indeed of living things. Um, so we have these principles of form from the Logos, which is the word, which is the principle of form, or as Hindus put it, Nama Rupa, names and forms. Um, and we have this principle of flow, energy, change, movement uh, within it, uh, which gives us life. And actually that's the very picture that science gives us of life. You have, you have the form of living things, they grow, they have particular forms, we recognize plants and animals by their forms. Um, even today, if you want to identify a plant, uh, you look at its shape and you go to Kew Gardens to the herbarium and look up the type specimen. You don't do it by mathematical formula. You do it by comparing the form. It's the form of the plant that makes a particular species what it is, that makes a foxglove a foxglove or a palm or, or a date palm a date palm. It's, they're classified on the basis of their form. Uh, that's the primary characteristic. But then there's all these processes going on within them, uh, which are to do with energy, uh, like um, movement, respiration, growth, um, excretion, nutrition, all these things that are on that list that you read out at the beginning of, of uh, that we learn at school of the characteristics of living organisms are to do with this relation of the energy and the form and the nutrition is necessary for the flow of energy uh, and so on. So what we see is a, a model of ultimate reality in the form of God or in the Christian case the Holy Trinity uh, as the source of all life but having life within it because the spirit is part of the entire creative process as it says in say, St. John's Gospel chapter 1 verse 4 in him was life. So life is primordial um, in, in the original creation of things um, and is reflected in all living organisms, whether they're biological or not, including stars and galaxies as living organisms, or, or even on a much more limited scale molecules and much smaller things, which in his philosophy of organism, the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead thought of as organisms, self-organizing systems, uh, even though they're very small, we don't usually think of an atom or a molecule as an organism, but he pointed out they're actually processes, they're structures of activity, according to quantum theory. They're not just inert stuff, like atoms aren't just like little billiard balls that are pushed around by external forces. They're complex organisms of structured activity. And your reference there, towards both form and also 
God and in God is found the um the origins of life. Um I think that you know that makes sense to me because of the response that we have to life and particularly the response we have to different kinds of life, the diversity of life, um, which is one of wonder, of awe, and maybe even the sense of giving praise um, because of the surprise at the diversity of life or the delight in discovering how different life can be and yet still be relatable. We can still somehow connect to it. And even when life is very strange or we're gazing across a wilderness um, where everything feels alien, even threatening, um, there's still a sense that somehow this is part of the expansiveness, the vastness of this notion of life. And if you're that way inclined, um, the extraordinary creativity of the source or the origin of all this life. There's a kind of imminent transcendence um, in the natural world. Um, as William Blake puts it, you know, to see a world in a grain of sand or heaven in a wild flower. It's like the very diversity of life and all different kinds of organisms, um, you know, including um, the subatomic world in that, um, that evokes this response from us. And I think that must be part of um, what you have to account for here, because, you know, those effects are, are real, they're tangible, um, and they can lead you somewhere. Um, to a sense of an origin of life because of the unity, even with the diversity of all living things around us. Um, yeah, so there's, you know, there's, again, maybe to, to go back to where we started, um, there's a reason why this word life can't just be collapsed into biological life, useful though that is, particularly when it serves a much more expanded and embracing notion of life as well. When it is collapsed into biological life, you have the view that modern mechanistic materialism presents us with, which is of an entire universe made up of unconscious matter uh, with no purpose whatever, um, with uh, that's just following mathematical laws blindly because it's totally unconscious. And then through chance, uh, some combinations of molecules come together on Earth. Um, and give rise to life on Earth, which is living organisms with DNA and molecular biology and that kind of thing, uh, all of which have just evolved by blind chance mutations and um, natural selection. Um, and so in that view, which is still the predominant view in our culture, we have an extremely limited view of life, just confined to biological life, and everything else is considered dead and inanimate. Um, but the view that we're discussing and which you've just summarized is this much expanded view of life within which biological life is just one part or one aspect or manifestation. And I certainly think that the, this expanded view of life is more life affirming than the uh, view of an inanimate purposeless universe with just biological organisms that have arisen through chance processes and, and natural selection. Um, so in a sense, everyone today has a kind of choice between these worldviews and you can, if you like, if you want to become a devotee of scientism, um, you know, adopt this very, very narrow view of life. Um, but it, I think it cuts one off from so much more that so the much wider, not just meanings of life, but experience of life that's possible with this more expanded view. I, I mean, I agree, and it, it just feels like you have to deny almost part of your response to life because you are yourself living. Um, and so the expansion feels quite an imperative to me. But look, thank you. Um, again, thinking about a word like life takes us in a lot of different directions. So I appreciate the contemplation of the word life. Me too. Thank you.